Well, welcome back and thank you so much for joining us for our live coronavirus town hall. Tonight we will be joined by five special guests who are leaders in our community. First up, we have Medical Director of Emergency Management at Mayo Clinic, Dr. Pratish Tosh, and Director of Public Health for Olmsted County, Graham Briggs. Welcome, guys, to the studio. Yeah, and you. before we jump into questions from our viewers, thank you, all of you viewers who uh, submitted excellent questions. Dr. Tosh, what do we need to know before we get started tonight? Go ahead. Yeah, sure. You know, people are looking at what's happening now and say, well, what are we doing now to prepare? Right. And uh, as, as Mayo Clinic, we've been preparing for pandemics for decades and have learned a lot from the 2009 influenza pandemic, but also things that have happened in between, including Ebola 2014, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome. And so our preparedness um, didn't just start six weeks ago, but is, has been building on really a legacy of preparing for anything that's going to come up. And so reassuring to so many people who have those questions, are we prepared? And so you're saying, yes, we are prepared. I think that's a, a safe statement. Yeah. We're going to do everything we can. And this has been building on really just decades of work. Yeah. Okay. And thank you, Dr. Tosh. As we mentioned, we also have Graham Briggs. He is the director of Olmsted County Public uh, Health Services. So do you have a quick statement for us before we jump in? I think like Dr. Tosh, uh, we have been working on this for a couple of decades now, really. Uh, uh, in uh, public health departments all over the country really thinking about if we were to see a pandemic or a large event. And so while we're prepared, I think, I, I think we both agree too that we are in unprecedented times here in this country. We're seeing a lot of things that uh, we haven't ever seen before with school closures and sporting events and things like that. So I think all of us are, are really adjusting to this new norm. Yeah, absolutely. So first question is for Dr. Tosh, and this is a, a question we got from a number of viewers, actually. When do you expect COVID-19 to peak here in Minnesota, and are we safe to resume some normalcy by June before summer really gets into full swing? What are you finding? <clears throat> sure. This is, a, unfortunately, a long answer to a short right. question. Go ahead. We got time. Um, we are right in the beginning of this for Minnesota. and. Uh, looking at the experience from China, you know, they had a good two months of, of things being pretty rough. Uh, but recently, there were no cases there. In fact, um, in the city of Wuhan itself, which is the epicenter of this, zero cases for the, for the first time. And so there's a light at the end of the tunnel. Even though we're at the beginning of this, we can see that light. Unfortunately, the only way out is through. And so this is going to be a, a difficult couple of months. A couple of months. I think uh, just based on what we're seeing elsewhere. And there's a lot of things we can do to affect that. The kind of social distancing that, that we're doing, I can't even touch Graham. Right. Um, Six feet apart. Right. Six feet apart right. or more. Um, and people staying inside and not really uh, engaging in, in mass gatherings, these right. sort of things. These actually work. And we're going to tr do what we can to try to limit the spread um, so that uh, the number of people who are infected, uh, we try to decrease those, but also try not to overwhelm the healthcare system, not just here in Rochester, but throughout the state and throughout the country. So some people think, okay, maybe a few weeks, but you're saying this really may be a couple of months that we're looking at here. You know, I'm expecting... Yeah. Uh, realistically. Realistically, we're right in the beginning of this. And I'm expecting us within the next few weeks to really hit our peak, and then it'll come down in the same fashion that it came up. Um, and that's what we're certainly looking at the experience from China. I think we can see the same thing. The longer part of that answer is after that, tough to know what's going to happen. So the, either the virus can disappear entirely, like in 2003 with SARS, or it can reemerge periodically, as we see with certain kinds of bird flu. Right or it could become endemic. Um, for example, Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, which is endemic in parts of the Middle East. And so we don't know quite what's gonna happen after that. And so we gotta be prepared. And concerns, of course, the Spanish flu of 1918 in the fall, like, you know, it, it kind of <laughs> subsided in the summer and then, boy, it just came back with a, a big roar in the fall. And that's when we had so many fatalities back in 1918. So you don't know. Yeah. Okay, our next question tonight is for Graham Briggs. Do you know how the confirmed cases, those patients who have tested positive for COVID-19, are doing today? 
Well, this one we've got a short answer. <laughs> so, uh, luckily here in Olmsted County, uh, the the handful of cases that we've seen and, and confirmed are all doing well. They're out of the hospital, and uh, so we've been lucky so far here. And we are currently standing tonight at about six confirmed cases in Olmsted County. Right. We know of six confirmed right now. We are. At this point, really starting to investigate more suspect cases as they're coming in, and, and so that number's starting to change pretty quickly, but as of today, we're at six officially. Okay, thank you, Mr. Briggs. Dr. Tosh, yeah. viewers want to know how long after exposure do first symptoms appear, and how long after exposure before you can spread the virus? So let me ask a f answer the f second question first. Yes. And the predominance of the transmission occurs from people who are sick, and there are going to be cases here and there where somebody didn't really feel any symptoms whatsoever and may have spread the virus, but those cases are really, uh, there's, there's a real minority of this. The vast majority of, of transmission is happening from people who are sick with it and coughing and sneezing. And it's those respiratory droplets that get onto surfaces and get on people's hands and they touch their face and then they get infected. So that is the predominance of the transmission. We say usually it's a, a between uh, you know, a week to two weeks that people, well, from the time they're exposed to the time they, they start to develop symptoms, it can be as, as long out as, as 21 days, but really the vast majority right around seven days, seven to 14. Is that kind of the magic where you hear about the two week quarantines just to make sure that those symptoms arrive and pass? That's exactly it. And that's the basis of the two week quarantine that the vast majority of people who are exposed would develop the symptoms of the disease within two weeks. Okay. Have you seen it where it's gone beyond those two weeks? I mean, I've been hearing too that, you know, in some cases you gotta wait for 20 days before it may reveal itself. What are you hearing on that? It, it, there are some cases okay. where it's, it's a little farther out from that two sure. weeks, but again, those are rare. And when you look into them further, it can be a little bit, uh, uh, sometimes the data isn't always clear. Like, sure. well, maybe they had a different exposure seven days later or something like that. Um, and so maybe the 21 days was actually 14. Okay. Ba and so it can be difficult and murky, but when you're looking at the data across uh, now you know, several hundred thousand yeah. people infected, uh, it really looks at uh, the vast majority are gonna be within that two weeks. Yeah, okay, all right. And Mr. Briggs for Olmsted County, again, some of these questions responses may overlap a little bit, but from another viewer, for Olmsted County, is it possible to know if cases are community spread and if so, how soon until we here in southeast Minnesota know, until the public knows about the cases? Right, so anytime a, a case is identified, we're working with the Minnesota Department of Health and, and we're doing this locally too. But, um, we do what we call a case investigation. And uh, so we call that person, we talk to, their, uh, to them or their family and, and really look at where they were before they got sick. And uh, we know this virus well enough, we're getting to know it better and better. Mm -hmm. Um, and we can look at where they were before they got sick within that time frame that we know they must have gotten exposed and if they were in Washington or Italy or, or something like that we can feel pretty comfortable that that's where they got exposed and then brought the virus back here what we're really looking for in these case investigations now in, in Minnesota is did they not go anywhere besides locally right here in town and uh, if we can't find a risk factor uh, then we start looking at, is there local transmission happening? We don't have any evidence of that here in Olmsted County so far. We do know of a handful of cases now in the Twin Cities um, that the public health experts can't tell you where they caught it. So we do know that we're seeing some transmission now uh, in the Minneapolis-St. Paul area. I think unfortunately it's, it's a matter of time at this point before we find local transmission here. But, uh, that's something that we're really actively working hard at right now as we investigate these cases is to, to try to figure out exactly where people are getting it. And then while we're still in containment, identify those people that they've subsequently exposed and make sure that we're not allowing that transmission to go additional uh, through additional people. Yeah. And another question from a viewer. Can you tell us which communities in Olmsted County those positive cases are? Can you tell us where those are in? Sure. Uh, one thing we really need to think about seriously when we're looking at infectious disease too is people's privacy. And so um, if we're looking at a smaller town or a smaller population, we want to make absolutely sure that we don't um, accidentally reveal someone's identity by saying that there's a case in this town or that town. I think in Olmsted County, um, we've got a tight enough community here that we can say that if it's in one place, 
We probably feel pretty comfortable. We're really all economically linked in this county, regardless of if you live in Rochester right. or Byron <laughs> or Stewartville. So, so I think as a community, we can say if it's if it's here, it's it's with all of us. And there's a little bit of stigma there too, isn't there? I mean, if you think, oh, my neighbor has this, and and there's. You know, you shy away from that. I mean, do you see any of that at all or hear about that? Well, you, you potentially could. I think with infectious disease, a lot of the time, uh, there's potentially stigma. You know, one thing I learned as an infectious disease epidemiologist in my younger years was that uh, disease like tuberculosis that a lot of people think is eliminated from this country um, is actually still around. And there's a lot of stigma with it in certain cultures where this is still a fatal, you know, disease that, that uh, people are scared of. And so with this particular disease, uh, um, there's there's that opportunity that people can associate uh, different uh, um, um, ethnicities and things like that and that's something we really want to make sure that is apparent to the community that this virus doesn't care where you're from or who you are it, it genetically just wants to jump into yep. the next person and cause disease any of us right right and this next question is directed at Dr. Tosh, but Mr. Briggs of course you can jump in here as well what is the rate of false negatives and positives so uh, we are uh, confirming some of our positive tests that we've gotten with other means. So it doesn't look like we're having any false positives. It's going to be a while before we really understand uh, if something is a, is a false negative. Um, you know, that it might be that uh, um, maybe somebody wasn't actually having symptoms or things like that. And so we're going to, it's going to be a little bit more experience before we understand that, but we, because this is a new test and a new disease. But the, the science behind that test is, is relatively old. And so our experience with other tests like it suggests that you know, our false negatives in people uh, for whom the test is recommended, so namely people who are sick with the disease, uh, that our false negative rates can be pretty small. Absolutely. Mr. Briggs, did you want to tie into any of that at all? Or? Oh, well, I think Dr. Sorry. Tosh is a great expert on PCR yep. <laughs> and the testing, so you, you said it. <laughs> so another uh, question from a viewer. In Olmsted County, why are schools closing but not daycare facilities? But I, I think this is something that um, um, it, it comes down to a, a variety of different things, but uh, in, in this state, the governor has the ability to change uh, how uh, schools uh, operate as far as the school year goes and so we've got some flexibility there I know we've got uh, Superintendent Munoz coming in right be able to talk You'll about be here that. in a few moments yeah but um, there's there's also the thought about what what sort of impact it has on the community when you close a school or a child care center and so um, right now we don't see a whole lot of evidence that we've got community-wide transmission going if we say shut down child care centers we really probably have a limited lifespan to that before really causing disruption to the community. And so um, there's some argument here to, to think about exactly when we do that, how long we do it for, um, uh, how we know that we're going to turn it back on once we turn it off. And, and so it, it's not a, an easy decision to say that we should just shut down daycares right. you know, for the next six months or something. A lot of viewers out there, I'm sure, can think that would impact their lives. Absolutely. And Dr. Tosh, this next question has come up uh, from a number of you viewers. Uh, Many there. times, yeah. yeah. So if you have the virus mm -hmm. and if you recover, can you contract it again? Yeah. Is that I've a learned, possibility? Yeah, of course. <laughs> I've learned in my career never to give absolutes. Right. Uh, but I will say that the preponderance of people who get infected will develop immunity and not get it again. Um, you know, there are cases that people say, oh, they, 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 re, they got it again, or they detected the virus again, and somebody had it previously. Um, and so those cases are going to be out there. But the vast majority of people who get infected with this will develop immunity and likely not get it again. But could it develop into another strain? And uh, is that a possibility too? So you may have a certain strain, you know, Mutate now. Mutate in any way. And then right in the fall mm -hmm. have another strain. I mean, is that? So I mean, that's something we're going to be looking out for. Yeah. And we already know there's four uh, coronaviruses that cause the common cold. There are other coronaviruses that have caused SARS and Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, MERS. And obviously, we're watching to see what, what happens with, with this coronavirus um, and as, as things develop over time. But right now, with the strain that we're seeing, um, the vast majority of people okay. who get infected with this uh, shouldn't get it again. Okay. 
a sliver of, of good news, you know, in the scheme of a things. Silver lining. Yeah, silver lining. Next question is for Mr. Briggs. So for Olmstead County, is there any guidelines for foster care providers? I don't think we look at uh, foster parents anything any differently than we would um, other caregivers or anything like that. There's nothing special that we need to be thinking about. Um, I think the big thing right now it, when we're looking at cases and exposure and risk is our anybody or, or, or our people in areas where there's active transmission happening and so if you were adopting a child from Seattle right now or from New York City you there might be some risk there and uh, if that child were to develop a fever it, it might warrant COVID testing but um, as far as foster care goes versus uh, uh, grandparents or parents I don't think we'd consider that any different. Okay so these next uh, few questions are about testing and uh, Dr. Tosh, is Mayo Clinic's testing impacted by the state's shortage of supplies and tests? We're hearing a lot of that in, yeah. nationally in the news. So the shortages being experienced by our, the state health department is actually reflective of national right. shortages. And we are uh, just as prone to these national shortages as everybody else. And so it's been a struggle for us as well. Um, and uh, if it's swabs or certain kinds of chemicals, reagents that we need to run the test or transport media, you know, that's what we're detecting now and that's really limiting our, our capacity to, to test. We're doing everything we can to make sure we're at least able to take care of our community the best we can, but we are affected by the, the same kinds of constraints to the supply chain that's affecting every other testing site in, in the country. Yeah. I mean, the governor just the other day saying, what was it, 1,400 or 1,700 tests are just have to be frozen because there's no way to, you know, put Process them through that. the system yeah. to determine if, you know, if they're positive or not. Yeah, no, it's, that's, um, it's, it's been a struggle and that's something we talk about every day. Like, how many can we run? What else, what else can we do to tr try to get these, uh, whatever is the limiting thing right. to get us, allowed us to, uh, to test more people, uh, you know, our, our, our commitment is to this community and to our region, and we're doing everything we can to, to keep up with what the demand is uh, just for us. Sure. sure. And speaking of testing, are Mayo Clinic's results being included in the numbers that are being put out by Olmsted County? And can you explain the basic differences between colds and COVID-19? Again, yeah. in a kind of a twofold there, but it applies I, to both well, of you. Want to take, yeah. start, start I, I can talk about reporting. Okay. Like, uh, yeah, any any time a positive test comes up, whether it's from Mayo or the State Department of Health lab or a private lab in California testing somebody that lives here in Olmsted County, that's reportable to the State Department of Health here. And so that's how these investigations that we talked a little bit earlier about, that's how those get kicked off, is once that positive lab gets reported either to us or to the state, um, we're, we're then going to initiate one of those investigations. So yes, they're, they're counted. And we did learn that some of those positives have come from the Mayo Clinic drive through site. We, so. we do know that, our, that uh, some of these six cases that we have in Olmstead County were actually tested through Mayo through the, the drive through right. site. Yeah. So Dr. Tosh, the yeah. second part to that question, the difference between yeah. colds, everybody seems to have a sore throat this time of year, mm -hmm. and uh, our other respiratory symptoms and COVID-19. Yeah, and there is such a wide range of disease that the virus uh, can cause. The vast majority of people are going to have fairly mild, moderate symptoms. To them, it may feel like a cold. In fact, you know, I mentioned earlier, uh, there's four human coronaviruses <coughs> that cause a cold. Right. Of course, there are other coronaviruses that cause much more severe disease. So this virus can cause minimal symptoms, may feel like a cold, may cause more severe symptoms, may feel like they have influenza, but it can also cause a really critical illness, including people uh, dying or, or needing uh, really advanced critical care, including being on a, a ventilator. Yeah. And uh, Graham, I was going to ask you, another viewer is wondering, is it safe to do takeout food and bring fresh produce from a store into home? What do you mm -hmm. say to folks who have that kind of question? Well, this is a respiratory pathogen, so we're not generally worried about uh, uh, foods and things like that. If you eat the food, um, your, your body's going to do a good job of, of getting rid of that virus okay. without causing infection. Um, we are looking at what we call fomite transmission, which is, uh, uh, so Tom, if you put your hand on that table, and I came and put my hand on that table, and then inevitably we as humans touch our eyes or our yes. mouth. 
Uh, if I got virus uh, into my body that way, there's a, there's a chance that you could potentially spread it. Really what I, I think we're seeing is the major risk factor though is if, a, if we're in a couple of feet of each other, that's why we're socially distanced here tonight and uh, we cough or sneeze on each other, that's really how you're most likely to get virus into each other's eyes and nose and, right. and things like that. Okay. Similar questions about mail as well, same idea? Right, right. Yeah, there, there's now starting to, uh, some data is starting to come out about the survivabil survivability of the virus uh, on surfaces. And uh, so this virus probably doesn't survive a long time, long enough to be shipped between um, uh, major uh, international uh, sites or anything like that. So um, there is some likelihood that it lives for a little while, especially on porous surfaces and or on clothes, maybe a day or something like that. But uh, still the chances are, are fairly low compared to walking by the wrong person right. you know, at the wrong time. Right, okay, okay. final yeah. question tonight uh, for the two of you. Are pregnant women considered to be high risk? So at this point, it doesn't appear to be data to suggest that pregnant women are at higher risk of having severe disease. Of course, this is a concerning population and a special population as we start to look into investigational drugs and things yeah. like that we can use and think, well, how might this impact an unborn child? But what we understand so far, it does not appear as though pregnant women um, are themselves uh, at higher risk of having severe disease, nor is the unborn child likely to, to have the virus spread, spread to them. That okay. is some. Um, positive yes, absolutely. information there tonight. Yeah. Well, thank you both so much for joining us this evening. We appreciate you taking the time to answer our questions. Brought to you, of course, by our viewers who had many questions for you tonight. Yes. And our town hall will continue in just a few minutes. And soon we will be joined by Senator Carla Nelson, Rochester Mayor Kim Norton, and Rochester Public School Superintendent Michael Munoz. Stay with us. Okay, thank you so much for joining us as our live coronavirus town hall continues tonight. We are now joined by Senator Carla Nelson, Rochester Mayor Kim Norton, and Rochester Public School Superintendent Michael Munoz as we continue to look at how the coronavirus is impacting us locally. Welcome, all of you. Absolutely. A big question, Mark, is uh, how is the school year going to end? So we will start with Superintendent Michael Munoz. What do we need to know from you before we start taking some of these questions? Yeah, I, first of all, I'd just like to say thank our parents for being patient with us, that we know that the unknown can be concerning for people, and uh, we're doing our best to communicate to staff and, and parents as frequently as we can as we get new guidance and decisions are made. And also want to assure parents that our, our staff have been working extremely hard these past few days getting ready for distance learning if we uh, get directed to do that. And I'm very confident, you know, we have amazing teachers and I know they're going to provide a quality education if we end up going to distance learning. All right. And we are also honored to have Se State Senator Carla Nelson joining us uh, representing District 26, which covers portions of Olmsted County. Senator, your thoughts also before we begin tonight? Well, I couldn't be more glad to be living in Minnesota at this time and Olmsted County particularly. Right. We know that these are challenging times, the uncertainty, the unknown. And yet I want viewers to know that um, Minnesota has been preparing for this. Before we even had a confirmed case in Minnesota, the legislature bicameral, bipartisanly, passed $21 million to get out the door so the Minnesota Department of Health could do the monitoring, the testing, the planning, and the preparation. Uh, and then um, Monday night, or I should say Tuesday morning, about 2.30, uh, we passed another $200 million uh, to fight this uh, epidemic, uh, protect our people, and uh, return to the lives that we're all used to. All right, thank you. Our third special guest tonight is, of course, Mayor Kim Norton. And there are, of course, many questions about what is in store for the Med City as we continue to face this rising threat of COVID-19. What are your initial impressions as we get started tonight? Well, I think we're in uh, uncharted waters. This is new. We've never faced anything like this again. But for me, the comfort has been the partnerships that we have with Mayo Clinic, with Olmstead County, with uh, people like I'm here with tonight, uh, and many, many of our nonprofits who really want to work together to do what's right. And I think our goal has to be to stop the spread, right. um, to prepare uh, once we get through this for recovery and protect our, our citizens, our residents, um, our businesses and uh, get back to normal as quickly as we can. Right. Our first question for you uh, for tonight, this group is for you, Mayor Norton. Would Rochester as a city make a declaration to shelter in place? 
Well, this has uh, come up several times, as, as you might imagine. I think the governor has said this is a tool in the toolbox, and it is indeed. Um, there's no uh, imminent uh, desire to do this, of course, but um, as we move ahead, it is certainly something we may have to do. I would say, uh, in general, the community has responded pretty well uh, already, um, staying at home if they can. There have been a lot of working from home, and we can talk about that later. But um, if we have to, we will. Um, so it's and you we'll just touched on that. Are you generally seeing the, the population here in Rochester following the health guidelines? That was another question from a viewer. Yes, I, we do have a number of people who have just taken it upon themselves to do this. And you know, we're very pleased and proud because that is what we need to do to stop the spread. Um, I think like, like anything, there's uh, differences and we can always do better uh, across the community, but uh, the, you know, kind of heeding the advice right. um, our, of our medical experts that you just heard, doing the safety precautions, and I think we will be moving into more people staying home, more people working from home in order to stop the spread. And keeping that six foot distance Absolutely, as all well. the hand washing, no, yeah. no hand shaking, right. all those safety precautions that we've been talking about for several, several weeks will need to continue throughout this yeah. whole pandemic. So important. Yeah, so Senator, at the uh, state level, a uh, viewer wants to know if people can't leave their home because they're quarantined, how can they get food and necessary supplies? And the viewer also asks, will the National Guard be activated to assist? Well, two questions yes. there. One, um, obviously we wanna make sure that everybody has access to nutrition, food, uh, their, the prescription drugs that right. they might need. And what we've seen is a lot of neighbors are checking in on their neighbors. We've seen a lot of action on Facebook, people checking in with folks they might need to know, are they doing okay? Yeah. So we're seeing a lot of people gathering up and supporting one another, which is very important. Um, but to the National Guard, that is one of the governor's powers that he uh, could activate the Nas National Guard. And I know the feds were actually also talking about this today as well. Um, currently though, regarding food and medicine, um, our stores and our pharmacies are open. Right. And so I think it's not likely tonight or tomorrow that the National Guard be activated, but it could in the future. We don't know, but that is one of the powers that the governor has. And what would you envision that would trip the activation of, of the guard. I mean, what what would what's a scenario that were that they would be important? Oh well, there's all kinds of scenarios, but the National Guard is there to uh, in times of emergency, disaster, often uh, national disasters. This is a different kind right. of a disaster, and I could see the National Guard if there was a need to um, open roadways, keep keep the peace, or if we're told to shelter in place to try and keep people off the roadways, uh, and so it all depends on what the need is. But we know that our National Guard are there to serve, they're well-trained, they have the tools to handle just about anything that comes their way. So uh, we're hoping that the governor doesn't need to call the National Guard, activate the National Guard, but if he does, I know that our servicemen and women will be ready to meet the challenge. All right. And Senator, you already mentioned a little bit tonight about some of the work that's been going on in St. Paul in response to the coronavirus, but also yes. uh, you mentioned that you've already filed legislation regarding COVID-19 and quarantine. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Yes, uh, we kind of watched this uh, through January and I got a sense that we just need to be prepared. And so I have a piece of legislation that would prohibit uh, someone from being fired just because they had to quarantine themselves for two weeks. We do not anticipate that any employer would do that, but it's always good to have these safeguards in place as well. Certainly. And Superintendent Munoz, uh, is it realistic possibly that the school year, the school year will resu resume and is extending the school year possible if this continues? Yeah, I think one thing that we can probably count on is that we're going to probably uh, go to distance learning. Uh, the big question is how long will that be? Will it be uh, a couple of weeks, a couple of months? Will it be to the rest of the school year? Uh, at this time, we're really not clear, but I, I'm pretty confident we'll probably, when we come back from spring break, be providing distance learning. As far as the, uh, extending the school year, that, that would be really difficult for districts. Uh, there's a lot of reasons. You know, for example, one reason uh, teachers are contracted to work 
right. so many days. And their days that they're doing now planning for their distance learning and their actual delivering additional learning counts towards those days. So uh, it would be a challenge to add additional days to their contract if we had to go to an extended uh, calendar, but uh, you know anything's possible. But uh, that would be quite challenging for districts across the state. And really briefly, just because we're running out of time, but on distance learning as it pertains to students, what are what's a big challenge that you're seeing right now? Well, originally we thought it was making sure that everybody had technology, and and we we feel we have a really good plan that we can provide devices for those students who do not own one. Right. And then you know there's a lot of companies providing free Wi-Fi, so right now we're trying to connect them to these companies so they can get that Wi-Fi connected uh, if we go to distance learning. Okay. Uh, Senator Nelson, another viewer question for you. What about high risk or immunocompromised people who need to self-quarantine but don't qualify for unemployment? Will the government compensate those people? Uh, yes, it looks like they will. Um, the feds have passed uh, legislation just, I believe, last night uh, that people who um, need to either uh, step out of work to care for themselves or their family members who might have uh, COVID, uh, the COVID virus um, would be compensated under the um, uh, UI. Absolutely. Mayor Norton, the big question here in Rochester is about our elderly population. So what is the city doing to protect, protect them? Well, I think the governor's made some uh, decisions that has impacted uh, the senior housing. Right. Uh, I received a call uh, just last night and spent quite a bit of time on the phone with someone who cannot visit her mother who is in recovery after surgery at a rehab uh, facility. And, you know, this is a really, really difficult time for families. Um, but because uh, COVID-19 uh, is so deadly for our senior and ill and compromised uh, populations, it is for their protection um, that they're being uh, secluded. So I, I suggested, uh, you know, sending her a card or asking to have the family member brought down to a window so she could walk by and assure her mother that she's there. So there are some things that can be done, uh, but it is for everyone's protection and safety that these measures are being taken. And uh, I, I don't think anyone would feel good about having infected a, um, a group of vulnerable right. people. Absolutely. Superintendent Munoz, high school seniors we know are all worried about one thing that is of course commencement. So will commencement ceremonies be rescheduled if the original date is missed? Well, I, I can't give you a definite answer tonight about that. I, I will say that depending on what type of restrictions that we're dealing with at that time, uh, I will say that if, if possible, we'll do our best to find some type of way to give them some type of ceremony. Uh, it is on our radar, but right now it's not a top priority, but as we get further into the, the school year, uh, we'll, we'll try to figure something out. We've got to finish the school year before we talk about yes. commencement. Yeah. Uh, Mayor Norton, another big question in Rochester is about public transit. What is the city of Rochester doing about park and ride shuttles and city buses and people sitting close together? Sure, we've done a couple things. One, we have, um, if uh, people want to take their own vehicle, which is uh, one of the ways that you can distance yourself is taking your own vehicle. We have um, uh, lifted the restrictions on neighborhood parking around uh, the hospitals and downtown areas so that people can actually get to work. So that was one uh, thing we've done. The second is we've increased the number of buses at the park and rides right. so that um, people, there will be less people on each bus uh, to, offer that distance um, that's recommended by And so the drivers will do a, a head count and say, well, we got too many people in yeah. here, you, you have to wait till the next one? Not only are they doing that, but they're taking precautions to wash down the buses extra times okay. uh, than we would normally have seen in the past. Uh, they do clean their buses, but now they're gonna wipe them down for everyone's protection multiple times during the day. And on that, you're gonna need a lot of wipes to you know, take care of all these bi uh, buses and other transit modes. Are, do you have enough? I mean, you hear the story of, people kind of running out on, on yeah. some of these. Of I haven't been told wipes. of a shortage yet, um, okay. but certainly that's something to you know all across out. the sectors um, we're hearing concerns about, as well as toilet paper and the other necessities that people are looking for that are in short supply. But um, I, I think uh, we'll just yeah. assume we have enough. I haven't been told otherwise. Right. Okay. Senator, another question about uh, employment tonight. Uh, for those who are experiencing unemployment, is there any special treatment for independent contractors not protected by an employer when it comes to unemployment? 
Well, that's a very good question. So we're talking about the uh, unemployment insurance. And typically, uh, independent contractors do not pay into unemployment insurance. So one would think they may not be eligible. But I do want, uh, and it's still kind of um, not totally ironed out at this point. There's some things coming from the feds as well as at the state level. I do want our uh, independent contractors, our small businesses to know that we're looking at um, accessing uh, small business administration loans. Uh, there's been some talk of uh, no interest loans for our business uh, men and women. Uh, and also uh, just uh, this evening, uh, the feds are talking about actually $1,200 cash into the pockets of um, all Americans. The idea is to keep our economy um, moving. It's kind of like the whole nation is on a two-week vacation, a summer vacation. It's not hardly a vacation, but the point is not in work. And so that has really caused a bit of a drag on the economy. And the point is, uh, one, keeping people safe. That's our number one job, safe and healthy. But then also to make sure that our economy begins running again as well. And I think things like um, looking out for our small businesses, our business owners can be a big part in that. Perhaps a word of calm tonight for so many. One thing that we continue to hear from viewers when we put out the announcement about this town hall is the question of, okay, when? When will the help get here? I mean, advise them from your perspective yes. that this work is being done. Uh, the work is being done. As I said, in Minnesota, uh, we passed $21 million out to our uh, public health before there was even a confirmed case here. And uh, just uh, early Tuesday morning, we passed another $200 million to get out to these folks who are on the front lines, um, our hospitals, our nursing homes, our paramedics. We want to make sure that we have the staff to, uh, to handle what, what may come forward. And I just want to be very clear that we have the strongest public health uh, system in this state. And we live right at the epicenter of the most high quality health care in our nation. And so I do have the greatest confidence, but we need to make sure that they have those resources uh, to do their jobs. And really briefly on the checks, um, so tonight the feds are saying it's 1,200. We heard maybe 1,000 or perhaps 2,000 over time. Yes. But when are we going to get these checks? What are you hearing? Yes. Um, well, I'm with you. I've heard all these different <laughs> numbers uh, throughout the day. I, I was working at home today myself, so I was able to hear more of that news. We don't know for sure, uh, but I do. we have seen swift action from the feds. I hope that we see that again, but no, I don't know that have an exact answer there. And the superintendent really briefly to, to tap on the e-learning, the distance learning with tablets. And, and this viewer is writing in, what if families can't afford a tablet for their students? What do you say to them? Yeah, we have a, a plan in place to make sure that they're every, at least each family will have a device. If they do not have one, we'll provide one for them. And uh, we've already, I think, checked out uh, devices for our high school students before they left on Tuesday and we're working on a plan and in, in making sure that our middle school and elementary students that don't have one at home uh, can come and check one out. Okay and okay. also another question for uh, Mayor Norton briefly is there assistance for people who fall behind on their utility bills is that available? Yes we have waived there will be no disconnection of, of utilities for failure to pay and any other um, Perhaps uh, changes or adjustments that need to be made will happen. Um, the board, the RPU board for one, is uh, very willing and interested in making sure we take care of our community members. And we were talking to, um, to kind of wrap up the segment. I would just want to briefly go with each one. You know, we have to also stay positive, and there are some silver linings in all of this, people really doing some good things. What Look are for you, the helpers. Yeah, you're right. What are you seeing out here as we kind of wrap up this town hall? Some, on a positive note, Absolutely. We'll, we'll start with you, Senator. Well, I think one of the things that we've seen is this goodness in eight in people that are concerned about their neighbors, their worker, their fellow workers stepping up to help one another. So that is a big, big plus. We also, I think, are going to see some pluses on down the road. Our schools are uh, adapting and adopting e-learning, digital learning. I think that's going to be a positive thing along the way. Uh, patients are being asked to do um, telehealth. 
Again, right. I think that is, these are innovations that are going to help uh, both in our healthcare system and in our education system. It's just that they're coming at a time now of, of crisis. And, um, but we know that we will be stronger on the other end of this. I would ask folks if there's any concerns or questions on any state issue that I can be helpful with, you know, do reach out to me, send.carla.nelson at senate.mn. All right. And Mayor. Certainly one of the uh, pluses has been uh, the committees we've set up at the city. Um, one's dealing with homelessness, one is dealing with uh, economics and, the, and the, trying to take care of our workers and our businesses, and the third is on a Neighbor Helping Neighbors program. And um, we've had calls every day in each of those committees all week long, and the number of nonprofits and citizens that have stepped up to work together to help solve problems, to make sure people are fed, to make sure our neighbors that may be homebound are getting help right. has really been remarkable. It's Especially Especially with the elderly population, your heart really goes out to some of them who might be homebound. Absolutely. So the neighbors, uh, our neighbors has uh, been a part of that, United Way. I mean, I could go on and on with the number of nonprofits that are really heavily engaged in trying to help people through this crisis. Yeah. And Superintendent, you have the last 40 yeah, seconds. Yeah, I, I would just say that all of our staff are coming together to really uh, meet the needs of our students. And just work quickly for the last two days, we have passed out more than a thousand uh, lunches and breakfasts to our students. Yeah. Uh, we had a meeting today that we're gonna try to continue doing that even during the spring break, partnering with the city and other partners. Mm -hmm. All right, well, we just wanna thank our guests. We know it's late. We know you're all working 24-7 on this. So we just really appreciate you being here tonight uh, so late to be part of this town hall, town hall meeting. Thank you very Thank much. You. Well, we certainly are in some uncertain times at this point, but we hope that tonight hopefully brought you some answers to the many questions that you undoubtedly have. Again, thank you to all of our guests, and thank you for watching, everyone. We will have more on this on our website at kttc.com. Have a good evening.